Hello, everybody, and welcome to our uh, webinar today. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Brian Haynes is going to be talking about the Bioflux system for circulating tumor cell research. Uh, Brian started working for Fluxion four years ago as a field application scientist and recently took on the role of global sales director for Bioflux. Brian has led Bioflux product development and supported research using bioflux in the areas of vascular biology, cancer, immunology, and microbiology. Today, he will talk about applying a cell adhesion assay to the study of circulating tumor cells. Before I, uh, before I switch to Brian, I would like to, uh, would like to note that if you would like to uh, ask questions to Brian, you can use the questions window, enter them in there, and Brian will answer them at the end of the, at the, end of the talk. Brian, are you ready? Yes, thank you. Let's get started. Okay. Uh, today, uh, and thank you all for joining, um, we're going to talk about how the Bioflux system can be used for, for CTC research. Uh, a lot of uh, other applications have been described before in previous webinars that include uh, platelet studies, uh, biofilm studies, and other cell adhesion studies, but this one is to focus on the cancer applications that are involved with with Bioflux. Let me start with a, a brief introduction about circulating tumor cells, uh, talk briefly about uh, Bioflux and a little bit about the technology, but not very much. The point of this talk is to show the applications that have been performed in the past and some opportunities that can come up for looking at um, cancer cell adhesion. And so there's three different areas I'm going to talk about. One is the role of uh, monocytes mediating uh, cell adhesion, um, the role of e-selectin in cancer cell adhesion, and then briefly talk about a paper that described shape and uh, the role of shape in particle sizes and particle adhesion for adhering to either endothelial cells or breast cancer cells. Circulating tumor cells, or we'll probably call them CTCs from here on, have to do with a theory of metastasis. Cells release in, from the primary tumor into the circulation and form secondary tumors. So if you imagine a, a primary tumor just shedding cells out into the bloodstream, these cells need to attach and then migrate through, and then they can produce a secondary tumor. And that's one of the, the leading theories, the leading causes. Uh, of metastasis is that um, of, of how these form. This mechanism is remarkably similar to how leukocytes adhere, uh, monocytes, macrophages, um, that they would bind to the wall of a blood vessel and then migrate through. The classic definition of a CTC or a circulating tumor cell is that is nuclear DNA positive, so typically staying with DAPI, EPCAM positive, cytokeratin positive, and CD45 negative. For diagnostic purposes, that definition of a CTC has been shown to be more predictive than classical biomarkers like PSI, PSA for determining outcome. Usually that's in the more chronic stages. The reason that people use Bioflux to study CTCs has more to do with the CTC adhesion theory that CTCs need to adhere in order to cause metastasis. And so we're, we're looking for the cells that essentially make the journey. Um, those, those are the important ones. Whether or not a patient has a certain number of CTCs has been shown to be prognostic, but to show how that mechanism occurs and then to be able to block that mechanism allows for therapeutic opportunities. The, the first report, and just a tiny bit of history, the first report on CTCs came out of Australia in 1869. And it was a really interesting paper because if you read how it was described, it sounds very similar to, to what we know today. But it was a case of cancer in which cells, similar to the ones in the tumors, were seen in the blood. Um, this was done after death. The patient died clearly of, of, uh, of cancer, and they took blood from the saphenous vein, and they showed that they could 
find tumor cells on the right panel here, cells that looked just like the cells that were in the tumor. And so that was the first description of CTCs, and since then, we've gone on to show that there are um, diagnostic and, and prognostic types of applications for this to show how cancer progression is happening. The, the main theory that we're looking at here is that you have a, a primary tumor that will shed these cells. Now, people have described CTCs as cancer stem cells in the past, and that definition sort of goes back and forth, but the concept of a stem cell having all the things required in order to form that next tumor, um, sort of the definition can go back and forth. What we're looking at with the bioflux is this mechanism of after the cells are, are shed into the bloodstream, that they would adhere and then migrate through in order to form this secondary tumor. And so this adhesion and migration process is, is what's essential in order to push metastasis forward. So in, briefly, in talking about mechanisms of cell adhesion, I, I show this to uh, people like my parents who, who need a little bit of more of a basic understanding. So if you imagine that this plate is your experimental surface, whether it's a glass cover slip or a, a plate, and this kimchi is, are the endothelial cells. This is the, the monolayer that's built up in the blood vessel. And when you see the tofu binding, the tofu represents either a, a lymphocyte or a circulating tumor cell or a stem cell that would adhere to the blood vessel, and then they would migrate through. And that, at that point, you know that the cells are most likely active and they have the ability to go on to do their function. So this is a type of phenotypic assay that we're looking at, not so much counting the cells or looking at gene expression in cells or protein expression, it's seeing the function of the cells and how they operate. This diagram is a little more detailed than the last one. But it describes basically the same thing, that you have a, a monolayer, in this case these are bone marrow endothelial cells, but an endothelial cell monolayer. And on top of that, you have active circulation, and cells that are in the circulation need to adhere to the endothelium, bind. Typically, it starts as a rolling, and then the cells slow down to the point where they've got what they call firm adhesion, and then at that point, they migrate through the endothelium and then produce their, their function, whether it's an inflammatory function or a cancer function. One of the proteins that's been well described. Let me repeat this mechanism of cell adhesion. That you have a monolayer of either vascular endothelial cells or, in this case, bone marrow endothelial cells. And on the other side of this is an active perfusion, uh, some sort of microvessel that is allowing the blood from, flow from, from one direction to the other. Cells need to tether and adhere, and then what they have what they call firm adhesion and then transmigration. So initially, as the perfusion goes through, the cells typically can't grab on and, and adhere immediately. They grab on and they roll in a certain way, and then after that, they're able to bind on firmly and then migrate through. Once the cells have migrated through, then they're able to produce their secondary function, such as um, in the case of inflammatory cells to perhaps clear an infection, or in the case of cancer cells to produce a secondary tumor. Not a desirable function, but it's, it's a function of what these cells are doing. The way the bioflux system works, and can help with showing this is that it's essentially a, a flow cell where you would put a monolayer of your cells on the bottom of this channel and then allow for perfusion to happen where liquid goes from one side to the other. The liquid is pushed by air and so one of the key parts of the way the bioflux works is that 
all the liquid is kept in the consumable. This talk is not solely based on Bioflux technology. It's more intended to show you the um, the bridge between the two. Uh, we have other talks that, that go into more depth and detail about the dimensions of the plates and the types of applications that we can do, but this is specifically focused on circulating tumor cell research and how Bioflux can help in that regard. Um, this is how the channels look, and so if you can imagine you've got an inlet and an outlet, and this is where your your viewing area would be, and what would take place is that you have a monolayer of of cells, typically Huvex, but other types of adherent cells. And then you would put over your uh, secondary cell type that you want to see adhesion to. Uh, this could be a type of CTC, a type of uh, circulating tumor cell. This could be a type of lymphocyte, or this could be a type of stem cell that you would want the adhesion mechanism to happen where this cell in circulation would bind to the wall of a blood vessel and then migrate through. The basic protocol for doing this with Bioflux is to seed a monolayer, and this typically takes between four hours to overnight incubation. Lots of people prefer to do this at the end of the day and come back the next day when a monolayer is formed. Some people like to wait three or four days in order for different gap junctions and, and cells to proliferate. I personally prefer to, to do this in a shorter period of time, but that's all based on the model of what you're looking for. Um, after that, a typical response time to activate cells uh, for a post-translational modification is four hours. Usually people will activate them with TNF-alpha, that's a classic response. LPS is also used or environmental toxin stimulants. And if you're working with a cell line and you're, you're for example, looking at specific mechanisms like overexpressing E-selectin and you've got a cell line that overexpresses E-selectin and you want to look at E-selectin mediated adhesion, that doesn't require any activation because the cells are already pumping it out unless it's an inducible system. Um, and then you perfuse your adherent cells over this, whether it be a cancer cell line, uh, lymphocytes, or uh, stem cells, and then analyze the rolling firm adhesion and migration. This is a video of a monolayer of Huvex cells that was stimulated with TNF-alpha and then HL60s, uh, which is a classic rolling inflammatory cell, are being perfused over. This is going at one dyne. This type of experiment is one of the model systems people use for looking at uh, Okay, I, I want to, for example, increase cell adhesion. I have another cell type, and I want them to behave like HL60. So based off of either changing the genes and, or, and eventually protein responses in the cell or treating the cell with a drug, which then changes the genes, um, that I want to be able to essentially what they call slow down the rolling. So the speed of rolling is inversely proportional to the amount of adhesion. So if the speed is slower, then it means you have a high amount of adhesion. If the speed is fast, meaning the cells bind and then immediately fall off or they fly very quickly across the endothelium, that suggests that the cells are not very adherent. And this is uh, an example of, of this adhesion assay in um, using Bioflux. The first paper I want to talk about has to do with um, a, a, really a sandwich mechanism. So people typically think of cancer cells binding directly to the endothelial layer, and, and that happens. But in this case, they showed that monocytes help facilitate that. And the addition of monocytes actually increases the number of in, in this case, a model system of CTCs binding to the monolayer. Uh, this came out of New Orleans. And so what they did was they demonstrated that the binding of CTCs to the endothelium was mediated by monocyte. They proposed the mechanism was uh, 
ICAM-1 on the surface of the CTC to beta-2 on the surface of monocytes and beta-2 on the surface of monocytes to ICAM-1 on the endothelium. They demonstrated that histamine augmented the response of TNF-alpha. Um, they used MCF-7 to model the CTCs, THP-1s to model monocytes, and Hubex cells. These are the vascular endothelial cells that come from endubical cords um, to model the endothelium. So I'll, I'll mention HUVEX throughout this, but that stands for Human Umbilical Cord Vascular Endothelial Cells. So when you say HUVEX cells, that's actually um, redundant. Cells were perfused to the bioflux system in this experiment, starting at 1 dyne and then was reduced to 0 0.2 dyne. If we look at the groups here, we have three basic areas. We have control cells. So these are cells that, that did not have any um, treatment at all. This is just the MCF7s plus the Hubex cells. So the Hubex cells were played out in a monolayer, and the MCF7s were perfused over this. And then we have where the Hubex monolayer was treated with the supernatant of THP1 cells that had been treated with LPS. Um, so that's treated with, the treated with, the treated with. But if you imagine THP1 cells being exposed to LPS, they will release TNF-alpha. And so this was endogenously released TNF-alpha. It wasn't spiked in. So probably a little more physiological than if you had just added, for example, 10 nanomolar to it. Um, and then the third one was the supernatant of the THP1s that were treated with LPS. So that's endogenous TNF-alpha with the addition of histamine. And so when you look at MCF7s alone, you see the number of cells that have adhered to the monolayer and the control is quite low. In the LPS THP1, this is, so this is supernatant that went over top of it, cell-free, um, you see that's pretty much tripled, almost tripled the, uh, the response here. And then it's increased even more with histamine. And then the next panel, which is really more interesting. The first uh, first three you would expect. The next three have to do with adding MCF7s plus THP1. So you see here that you've got the control, which is very similar. The LPS and the LPS with histamine are both significantly higher than the cells that did not have THP1s in them. So what it's suggesting is almost like a sandwich mechanism that the MCF7s are binding to the endothelium through a mediation mechanism of the THP1s. And it's more than just any inflammatory cytokines that would be released by THP1. This is a cell-cell-cell interaction here. On the top panel, it shows the, the Hubex cells as they're stained with uh, VE cadherin. And it shows uh, more of an activation here, but not much besides a, a qualitative data on the top panel. The bottom panel shows fluorescently labeled MCF7 cells and then the other cells, and you can see them here in, in phase quite nicely, on the right side are THP1. So on the left side, it's just MCF7s binding to uh, onto the Hubeck monolayer. On the right panel, it's the MCF7s plus THP1s binding to the Hubeck monolayer. And so you see a lot of these THP1s that are circles, and then the fluorescently labeled ones are the MCF7s. And so the THP1s are, are helping to mediate this adhesion mechanism. The next paper came out of Cornell, and it was looking at the, the role of E-selectin um, uh, for, for circulating tumor cell adhesion. And the, the primary output that they looked at was the rolling velocity of CTCs. So if rolling velocity increases, uh, cell adhesion essentially decreases when stimulated HUVEX are treated with an anti-E-selectin antibody. 
So an antibody that would bind up the E-selectin and would take that out of the equation. The MDA cells were used to model the CTCs, and Hubex were used to model the endothelium. What's interesting in this paper is that they specifically point out that the bioflux was selected at this point because of its reduced sample volume and easier setup procedure compared with the parallel flow plate um, and allowed for more flexibility with working with rare cells like CTCs. This first one doesn't look at E-selectin, this first uh, figure, but it looks at uh, an antibody specific for prostate-specific membrane antigen. And so when they said that the cells were either UNL, which is unlabeled, so essentially control, versus is labeled cells, they're looking at these MDA cells that were adhering to E-selectin that's bound to microtubules, so that the channels were coated with microtubules that were, were coated in E-selectin. And you see this at a range between 0.5 dyne to 8 dyne. And it's not until 3 dyne that they see a difference between the unlabeled and the labeled cells. <coughs> the labeled cells having a lower rolling velocity, meaning that they had more adhesion. Um, and as you get up to 8-dyne, you see a more significant difference between the labeled and unlabeled, suggesting that this um, prostate-specific membrane antigen has some sort of function in mediating uh, cell adhesion. The second panel, or second figure here, is looking at uh, MDA cells that are rolling over Hubex that were stimulated with IL-1 beta. So the different groups are Hubex stimulated with IL-1 beta, that's stimulated here, stimulated with IL-1 beta and then neutralized or blocked essentially with anti-E-selectin, so that's STNEU and then unstimulated cells. So these are cells that did not have any IL-1 beta stimulation and were just um, uh, producing endogenously expressing uh, proteins. So what you see in the three different panels here is that the stimulated cells that are not treated with anything but just stimulated have a very low rolling velocity in all of the dynes. They go from 0 0.5 to 4 dynes. And it, this increases a little bit, which would be expected as, as you increase the, um, the shear rate that the rolling would be faster, but not much. And then what you're looking at is that when they neutralized the, the E-selectin in this, so after they treat with IL-1 beta, there are lots of proteins that wind up getting expressed on the surface of the endothelium, one of those being E-selectin on the surface of the endothelium. And then, of course, the MDA cells have the E-selectin um, ligand to it. That the rolling increases uh, quite dramatically here between the stimulated and stimulated where E-selectin has been neutralized. And actually, that's even higher than the unstimulated cells. So even the endogenous E-selectin, at least at 0 0.5 dynes, the endogenous E-selectin is important, it suggests, for this rolling uh, adhesion mechanism. The, the next one is at 1 dyne, and it, you see um, stimulated and then stimulated and, and uh, neutralized with E-selectin. Where you don't see a, um, a bar, they were unable to detect the cells, meaning that nothing was actually binding. So the endogenous uh, E-selectin had a role at 0 0.5 dynes, but really had, didn't have much of a role at between 1 to 4 dynes. It wasn't enough to, to hold them on. This data is a little more clear in a, a second publication. This is actually a progress report. The work that was in the last paper was funded by the U.S. Army, which is interesting because you think of the U.S. Army as typically funding uh, work related to, to pathogens or, in our case, uh, blood clotting, because those are things that affect the soldier. But as the U.S. Army is responsible oftentimes for a soldier's care throughout the rest of their life, cancer is also uh, an essential mechanism that they, or a disease that they want to study and eventually treat. So 
you do see the Defense Department funding cancer research. This is a, a simpler view of the last figure where it shows the rolling velocity here on the left. And they had labeled this E4 Hubeck, but that's not actually accurate, the dyne rate of 0 0.5 to 4 dyne. And on the IL-1 beta stimulated, you see how the rolling velocity increases just gradually um, as a result of um, the increased uh, Sorry, give me a second here. Uh, the increased shear rate, but with the IOM beta with the control, they're unable to detect it. The, the next paper I want to mention uh, came out of Harvard, and this was looking at uh, prostate cancer uh, adhesion and uh, circulating tumor cells. So the idea that the, and bone marrow, so the CTCs would migrate through the endothelium of the bone marrow and cause a bone marrow mediated cancer. In the paper, they modeled the prostate cancer cells binding, rolling, and migrating through. Cubic cells were used to model the bone marrow, and PCA cells were used to model bone marrow um, cancer cells. E-selected ligand was overexpressed in the PCA cells in order to model and, and dissect out the mechanism of, of e-selectin. So I have a video here that didn't embed correctly, but can be shown very easily. This monolayer that you're looking at is the is used to model the the bone marrow endothelial cells. It's actually they're Hubex cells, so there's a little bit of a limitation in what they're they're claiming. But then the cells that are going over top of this are the PCA cells that are overexpressing. E selectin. And here you see the cells binding to the monolayer. And then migrating through. And we'll play this one more time here. So this is showing the prostate cancer cells binding to the, the monolayer of the bone marrow endothelium and then how they would migrate into the bone marrow of the patient causing a, a bone marrow cancer or bone marrow tumor essentially. And so not only were they able to get that video, but they were able to quantitate out the data with that as well. They called it, instead of transmigration, they called it breaching, but essentially the same thing, migration or breaching. They showed that the, the cells basically completely migrate through after 250 minutes. In the, the right panel here, they show a confocal image of the red cells are the, the monolayer and the green cells are the... Uh, the endothelial, oh, I was right, the, the prostate cancer cells. And so this was done with confocal, but it could just as well be done with a, uh, an epifluorescent scope that had a deconvolution software on it with a Z stack. Uh, the last paper I want to talk about here has to do with. The, the shape of, of particles and their adhesion onto uh, either breast cancer cells or onto endothelial cells. And so the paper actually talks about breast cancer cells, but on this figure, these are, are Hubex cells. And what they're looking at is uh, two different shapes of these uh, 3D constructed particles. One are, are spherical particles that have a hollow core inside and then cubical particles that have a hollow core. And what they showed is that the cubicle, under static conditions, the cubicles bind uh, quite, uh, quite significantly to the endothelial cells compared to the, the spherical cells. The spherical cells seem to roll off a little bit more. And that was sort of the conventional wisdom, but when they put this on the bioflux, they actually saw something a little bit different. What, 
which helps dissect out these minute differences. Some are, are small and some are much more significant between running assays in static well plates versus running them in uh, active perfusion or controlled shear flow. So SEM stands for the square shell and C stands for the circular shell. And at the low shear rate, you see that the squares were binding more than the circles, but not by a huge, um, huge margin here. When they increase the shear rate 10 times, you see actually that the, the circular shells were binding, um, which is um, was quite interesting. So this was meant to sort of summarize both basic cell adhesion mechanisms and then uh, the way bioflux helps contribute to circulating tumor cell research. At this point, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. You're also welcome to email questions to us. Um, I'm out of the East Coast in Maryland. Uh, our office is in South San Francisco. And so we're able to, uh, to respond back typically within, um, within a few hours, whether you, you hit us in the morning or you hit us in the evening. There was one question about the uh, the shear rate and mediating um, and mediating adhesion to let's get back to this one figure here from Cornell. They were asking about why these bars were missing, and the reason is that at higher shear rates you don't have endogenous adhesion. Um, so they asked, you know, why didn't they see three? You see three groups here. Why this one was missing? The reason that these bars were missing is that endogenous levels of adhesion oftentimes won't be enough to adhere beyond 0 0.5 dynes. And I have an example of that in a video here. So this was the control of the video I showed earlier where you have a monolayer of endothelial cells that were simply unstimulated, and the HL60s are not binding to that. If we were to reduce this down to 0 0.5 dynes or 0 0.25 dynes even, you would see some of this binding and adhesion just to the native site. But at one dyne, typically things will fly off if they're not um, not stimulated beyond their typical endogenous levels. Okay. Oh, I do have another question here. One second, please. So the question was, what instrument was used to study the tumor cell binding through the monocytes to the monolayer. Uh, the instrument was, so the monolayer and the monocytes were perfused using the bioflux, and then a microscope was used to, to image this, an inverted scope. Well, thank you all for um, for joining this webinar will be uh, put online uh, for future reference or if people were unable to attend due to um, other conflicts or, or time zone issues. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Uh, goodbye. Thanks. Bye-bye.